Morning and welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, and Dr. Hazel Othello, Director of Mental Health at the Ministry of Health. The Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Uh, good morning to ladies and gentlemen of the media to the listening and viewing public wherever you are in Trinidad and Tobago and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have a slight break from tradition this morning. The Chief Medical Officer will give the detailed uh, update for you. I wanna take this opportunity to remind the country of where we came from, where we are, and where we are going with COVID-19 because I think sometimes we have forgotten what we have done in Trinidad and Tobago since January. The date I would like members of the media and the uh, listening public to bear in mind is March the 11th. On March the 11th, the World Health Organization declared the 2019 and COVID to be a pandemic. That was on March the 11th. That's a very important date. Why is that date so important to us in Trinidad and Tobago? It is important because your government, led by a very proactive prime minister using science, on January 29th or 30th, started the first mitigation strategy when the cabinet on January 30th, a full month and a half approximately before WHO declared a global pandemic, took the first major mitigation strategy in the Western Hemisphere, and that is to impose travel restrictions on anyone who had been to China, and they must spend 14 days outside of China before coming into Trinidad and Tobago. With me, I have a list of about 34 mitigation and containment strategies, which I will not read out. 34, six of them before March the 11th, and the remainder from March the 11th going forward. We took the decision after January 30th to also include other countries, Iran, South Korea, Italy, Singapore, and Japan. And then we expanded that. We also took the decision to suspend the rest of the cruise ship season. And I want to remind the country that right now, the global figure for COVID-19 is 2,752,899. We are closing in on 3 million around the world. That's to date. 192,267 and recovered 761,494. Now spread across 210 countries, territories, and international conveyances. And I want to pause there for a while. Remember, the government took a decision to suspend the cruise ship season. The Diamond Princess is listed on the website as one of these international conveyances where there were 712 cases of COVID. If the government did not take that proactive measure to suspend the cruise ship season, I want the country to think about what would have happened if we had 3,000 visitors on a cruise ship like the Diamond Princess in Port of Spain, walking around Port of Spain, taking maxi taxis to go on sightsee, Maracas, wherever. It would have been an unmitigated disaster for Trinidad and Tobago. I just want to make the point that your government, led by a very proactive Prime Minister, prior to March 11th, when WHO declared this a pandemic, since January, we were taking the proactive steps 
to protect Trinidad and Tobago. There will be a time and a place to discuss all 34 measures that we have taken. And I want to congratulate the government and the Prime Minister listening to the science that took these decisions that has saved us from a very terrible feat. Uh, that's my little update on the global situation and the local situation for this morning. And Minister Cox, I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. At this time, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, will provide us with a clinical update. Good morning, Honorable Ministers, members of the UN and listening public. So the clinical update as of Friday the 24th of April 2020 is as follows. Total number of tests submitted to CAFA, 1,473. Total number of patients tests, 1,226. Total number of tests that have been repeated, 247. Total number of positives remain at 115. Total number of discharges are now at 48. New patients, none over the last 24 hours. Hospitalized patients have actually gone down to 10 persons at the Coover facility. There are now no persons at the Cora facility. In terms of, so in terms of our total hospital load, we're looking at 10 patients at this point. In the convalescence centers, we have a total of 49 persons, and those 49 persons are split between the Sandy Grandi facility, where we have 11 persons, and the home of football, where we have 38 persons. So in terms of, that brings me to the end of the clinical update for today. Um, thank you, Minister Cox. Thank you very much. Good news, it seems. Dr. <laughs> Hazel Othello, Director of Mental Health at the Ministry of Health, will now speak on COVID-19 coping mechanisms while at home. Dr. Othello. Good morning, Honorable Ministers, Chief Medical Officer, members of the press, and of course, our listening public across Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, this morning, I want to remind you of some of the things that I've shared in the past and share a few more things that I hope would be helpful towards you as you stay at home and manage this situation. It is very important for you to manage your emotions. These are difficult times, and from what we're hearing in the international news, this may be with us for a while, so we have to manage it one day at a time knowing that we may be doing this for a while. One of the important things is to maintain a daily routine. In other words, if you are working from home, try to set up a schedule that as close as possible resembles what your normal work day would have been like if you were going to work. And if you're not employed at this time for some reason, maybe your workplace is no longer functioning right now then you need to find creative ways to maintain a schedule that keeps your mind engaged and keeps you active. And that can include things like hobbies and new projects that you know, make you feel positive and make you feel energized and charged and positive about things. Try relaxing with daily exercise. That's very important. Exercise is good for us physically and mentally, and it helps with sleep, which could be difficult at a time like this. Engage in new hobbies. Um, don't forget your spirituality. Prayer and meditation and reading the scriptures is important because many of us find help there in these times. In addition, if you feel overwhelmed, please talk to a friend or a healthcare worker or a counselor or somebody in your community who you respect and look up to who can help you cope. Stay connected with friends and family. That's very important. And you may have to do this virtually. You may have to use your internet, email, things like WhatsApp and other media that you can use so that you are connected to people even if you can't visit them at this time. And of course, start each day with gratitude. Focus on the positive things. In the midst of all the negative things, there are always positive things that we can focus on. Even if it's you know one plant out in your yard that happened to flower this morning, Enjoy the beauty of that flower and remind yourself that all is not lost. In addition, we want to talk to people who are self-quarantining or in isolation. You also need to stay connected. You also need a routine. Remember your coping skills. Whatever has worked for you in the past will more than likely work for you again. So whatever coping skills you generally use, please adhere to them. And acknowledge this experience in a positive way. In other words, remember that you are doing this to protect your loved ones. 
So it's not a form of punishment. It's not anybody trying to be mean to you. It's just you taking responsibility to protect your loved ones. Also, for workers, particularly healthcare workers, remember that you have to get your rest, you have to exercise, you have to take breaks, you have to remember to eat well, and you have to unwind, you have to de-stress at the end of the day, right? Whether that means relaxation exercises or physical exercise or other things that help you relax. And connect with colleagues, supervisors, friends, talk to trusted persons, particularly people who share the same experiences that you share in the workplace, support and encourage each other. And then, of course, we want to talk about children. Children are very important at this time. So parents and guardians, talk to your children about what is happening. Make sure that they are understanding what is happening in the language that they can understand. And to that end, since the last time I spoke to you, a really excellent resource was made available. It's a book called My Hero Is You, and it's available on the WHO website. And I want to recommend that parents read that book with their children. It's an excellent resource for helping children to understand what's happening in a very positive way. Remind the children that there are adults working hard to keep them safe and that they can also contribute to remaining safe by hand washing and not touching their faces and things like that. And of course, don't forget to spend some time every day with doing some schoolwork. And I, um, from what we've been seeing, Ministry of Education has been providing resources to assist you with that. I also want to talk a little bit to employers. Please manage the behavioral health of your staff. In other words, do what's pos the positive things you can do to assist your staff, provide accurate and timely information to them so that your staff knows where they can get support when they need it. Adopt a family-friendly working environment in order to support your staff and their family needs. Check in on the well-being of your staff members periodically. And even if you know the workplace is not functioning as it usually does, as it usually does, you can still check in virtually with your staff to make sure they are doing okay. And of course, ensure that if you are up and running, that national public health measures are being adhered to in order to keep your staff safe. I want to now drill down a little bit and talk to specific groups of individuals who may at this time have a little more difficulty coping and tell them how they can cope, particularly people who are dealing with loss and bereavement. And bereavement doesn't just apply to when there's a death, because we've all lost things that we've gotten accustomed to and that are a normal part of our lives. If you are dealing with reduced income due to not being able to work, if you feel as though you've lost your sense of freedom because you can't go or you shouldn't go everywhere that you would normally like to go at this time. If a loved one is in a hospital at this time and you're not able to visit them. If you have loved ones working on the front line who have elected not to come home every day because they don't want to put you at risk. And of course, if sadly you may have lost a loved one due to COVID or due to some other disorder and you were not able to attend a funeral and say goodbye in the way you normally would. For adults, I want to remind you that you are not alone at this time. Help and support are available. It is normal to feel sad, to cry, to express anger or disbelief, fear, shock. These are normal emotions when you've lost a loved one. So it's okay to feel that way, but it's not okay to blame yourself or to beat up on yourself because of something that you thought you should have said to that individual before they passed or something that you thought you should have done. Hindsight is twenty twenty. We could always think about what we could have and should have. It's important to value the good memories, the positive memories, and to use those memories to approach this in a positive way. Please stay in contact with relatives. You don't want to be alone at this time. This is not a time to try to fight it out on your own. You may need to schedule times to spend time talking with relatives at home and abroad so that you all can encourage each other at this time and you know, have a laugh, share a memory, and try to be positive. Uh, if you're at home with relatives, then of course you can talk to them as you share those memories and you know, laugh about the funny experiences you would have shared with that person while they were alive. And of course you can create memories through photos and videos and things like that that remind you of the time you would have spent with that person. 
don't forget to get fresh air breathe in and out deeply when things are overwhelming you know in and out slowly and deeply and it helps you to relax remember to eat well and to sleep well or do your best to sleep well uh, try not to use things like alcohol to help you to sleep in other words do lean on exercise and avoiding caffeine and things like that natural healthy way and if you just google sleep hygiene you will get a lot of tips that can help you to sleep and of course if you are feeling overwhelmed please talk to someone if you are feeling overwhelmed also and having difficulty concentrating please do not do any dangerous tasks because we don't want you to get hurt and of course families that have to plan final arrangements for our loved ones of course try to stream those arrangements so that other loved ones who cannot attend can still be a part of that goodbye experience. I hope that these tips would help you as you navigate these difficult times. And of course, if you are having difficulty and you feel you're not coping adequately, please reach out to the mental health services that are available, either through the Ministry of Health and the RHAs at the various clinics. And uh, there is also information on the website of the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists with regards to some free resources that are available to the public at this time. So I wish you all the best and I hope that we continue to cope and we continue to go one day at a time, moving forward in a positive direction, knowing that we can all survive this and come out stronger on the other side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Othello. Members of the media, the floor is now <coughs> open. And remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. We want to give you, as many of you, an opportunity to pose questions to us. But that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. Once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. So let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. We start today with Prior. Good morning, Prior Bihari, EZP News. Morning, Prior. Um, Dr. Otello, um, thanks for coming again. Um, I just wanted to find out, we have a number of homeless people in Port of Spain and in San Fernando. Um, people are concerned that they might have the COVID-19. Um, can we do any testing on them, or and what is the protocol with that? And and to doc, and to the um to to Minister of Health and Dr. Parasram, in terms of of the um posthumous testing that you all spoke about yesterday, mm -hmm. can I find out when you all knew about it? Mm -hmm. One and can we get an idea of the ages okay. of the people ages. who passed away and were tested? And also, is it is hello, it Brian? Two questions, sir. Uh, two questions. Okay, um, okay. Okay. Can I just ask one quick question? If we have the time, I'll come back to you. All right. Let oh. them answer both questions now, and then I'll come back so, to you. So, prior, thank you, thank you for the questions. The chief medical officer, who is in charge of testing protocols throughout the country, will address all your questions because it deals with testing. Um, so, over to the chief medical officer. Okay, so let's start with the homeless groups. So homeless groups are uh, a vulnerable population. We described it because of the way they, they interact. Difficult sometimes in clusters that you have a lot of people mingling together. There's no social distancing. Hygiene is difficult as well. So we recognize that very early on as a vulnerable population. We have layers with social development as well as the Red Cross to reach out to these people. I know social development, the Ministry of Social Development has something in place in, by way of shelters, um, doing thermal scanning and those and, and a number of other protocols that they have discussed with us and we have been assisting them with. However, as a group, anybody in this country that, that presents to our facilities will be treated in the same way. So they will be tested, they will be um, clinically managed just like any other citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of your, your testing, we would have been, this testing would have actually started way back since March 7th. And it continues. The last test we would have done was the 21st of March. And I'm glad you asked the question because there seemed to be some misunderstanding as to what the testing is about. So basically, this is persons that would have died outside of the hospital. In any epidemic, when you're trying to categorize community spread and other things, you look at the number of deaths that occur in the population. 
the deaths that we would see coming to us are the deaths that are occurring in the hospitals. The ones that we don't see are the ones that are occurring in the, in the homes. We don't really see it in a real way. Um, the DMOs go out to, to those cases, and then those cases are either go, going to the Forensic Science Center or they go to one of the hospitals. So in, in the case of the Forensic Sciences Center, they would be conditions usually related to, to homicide, suicide, and the like, and unexplained deaths. We decided to test those. To, it, it gives us a very good sense of what was happening in the community as well. So out of those 69, as I said yesterday, and one in Tobago, 70, none of them were positive. Gives us a good idea of community spread or lack thereof. And it, as I said, it goes way back to the 7th of March. So it gives us an idea from the 7th of March to present that the deaths weren't unexplained, the deaths that occurred in the homes. At least we were ruling out COVID since then. So in a country that is not doing a lot of that, for instance, in any country, when you have a new epidemic, even if you are not testing and it's re resulting in unexplained deaths, you'll see a large increase in the number of deaths. And it was very good to have that data way back from the 7th that suggested that there's little or no community spread occurring in the unexplained deaths from the community. Thank you. I-95.5. Good morning, everyone. With Good you morning. Today from I-95.5, I have two questions. The first sure. for Dr. Otello. <clears throat> uh, rehab centers equipped at this time to accept persons who may wish to check themselves in. Mm -hmm. And has any attention been paid to substance abusers and the challenges that mm -hmm. they are facing at this time? And my second question, I'd like to get a response from all of you. It's been said that we are at war against an invisible enemy at mm -hmm. this time. And in war, the battle can be won or lost based on the capacity of the persons who are in the situation room. You all are charged with protecting the health of the nation. And my question, therefore, is how are you all coping right now, physically, <laughs> psychologically, emotionally? <laughs> And what do you do to de-stress after a day at work? And perhaps okay. Dr. Otello might be able to um, <laughs> shed some light as to what advice she normally would give you all to cope with this very stressful time. Okay. So, okay. So, thank you very much. Um, I am heartened uh, to know that um, there is some concern <laughs> about the health of the Minister of Health and everyone. I am really, I'm really touched. I'm, I am really, really touched by your sentiment. Um, I think that is going to give all of us at the Ministry of Health and all healthcare workers the added impetus to work on behalf of you, your family, and Trinidad and Tobago. All of us cope at the Ministry of Health. And I'll tell you something, we meet quarter to eight every morning we have our team meeting of about 12 people in a large room. We all wear masks. But as a person responsible for leading that team, the first coping mechanism is that we conduct those meetings in not a morbid fashion, but in a serious manner that gives everybody an opportunity to relax and report. Um, my own self, I have found some solace back in the Bible, which I strayed away from. Now that I have some time, I read the Bible a little more online. I go back to my old music days. I remember Ravi Shankar. I am now tuned in to Ravi Shankar and his daughter, Anushka Shankar, who is an expert sitar player. So I do all those things. The chief medical <laughs> officer can tell you what he does. <laughs> but we are trying to cope. And I thank you, and we will be here with you every mile of the way. Thank you very much. I think there was another question. To, yeah, Dr. Othello has to Yes. Dr. Othello, there's a question for you to answer. Yes, I think I heard a question about rehabilitation centers, and I just want to let the public know that the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Center at Cora is up and running. They are uh, providing inpatient services uh, they have modified their outpatient services clearly to accommodate physical distancing. So, and people who are stable and don't need to come in for a session are uh, getting their counseling through telemental health techniques. 
So that is taking place as healthcare providers. We are aware of the increased risk for substance use disorders at this time, and we have taken that on board. Uh, with respect to my distressing techniques, uh, mm -hmm. I also find my peace and my help in times of, in particularly any storm, um, from my relationship with God. I, I actively read the Bible. I participate in worship experiences. And right now, uh, my church is meeting virtually using Zoom, so that has been really good for us. And I love to exercise, I love music, and I enjoy those things. Unfortunately, I'm not getting as much time to be as creative as some people are able to be at this time, but I'm doing what I can to maintain my peace of mind and to not allow myself to be overwhelmed by the circumstances or to be overly tired because it's easy to get overly tired. And sometimes as service providers, we also have to shut down. Sometimes we have to turn off our phones for a while and we have to get that R&R &R that we need in order to be fit for the next leg of the journey. Thank you, Dr. Otello. We move to 98.1. Good morning to the panel. And, Good morning, uh, Mr. Cummins. Yes, and uh, Stephen coming here, 98.1 FM. Uh, Minister Leal Singh, thank you so much for uh, keeping um, the uh, experts uh, you know, coming. <laughs> uh, two questions quickly. Um, one for Dr. Otello, and um, I can pose the other one to Dr. Prasaram. Uh, Dr. Otello, um, can you tell us more about the country's national mental health plan, both uh, for now and post-COVID-19. There's a sense uh, of a population reeling under extreme uh, emotional and mental pain at this time. How is this uh, national plan, um, how do you propose that this na national plan be rolled out um, in, in the context of um, what we are facing? And the second question is for uh, Dr. Pasram. I want to refer again to an earlier question I posed uh, regarding the way the daily press releases are issued. Uh, we have seen a shift in the data um, where we are now seeing unique patient tests. We are seeing a number of repeated tests and the mapping of laboratory confirmed positive cases um, with some basic demographics. The question I had earlier, which uh, the minister said he needed uh, guidance um, from, uh, from you, uh, CMO, was uh, the possibility of including uh, a section, a category, showing a gender breakdown of males to females affected mm -hmm. from the point of testing to being discharged. Uh, was there any further consideration for this to be included? Yeah, so, so if I take my question first. So in terms of the gender, it is something that would have been taken into consideration when Dr. Hines was presenting on his demographic chart. I, there's no issue at all with us presenting that data to the population, and when when we do the demographic chart, we can include it in that in that for, format, which might be the easiest format to include it in, number of males, number of females. And we include it as a disaggregation as it relates to age as well. So we can do that. Um, when we send out the demographic chart that we did before, we can include it there. I think there's um, Dr. Othello. Yeah, Dr. Othello. Yeah. With regard to the national, I think the question was about the national mental health plan. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, what we have is a national mental health policy that was approved by cabinet in no November of last year. And it is now in the process of being retooled into a national plan. In other words, the plan is for the implementation of the policy. The focus of that policy is on the decentralization of our mental health services. And I know past, um, Minister has spoken about that on a few occasions. The COVID-19 situation simply see, serves to re-emphasize for us the importance of that project because it shows us how, even more how important it is for services to be available to people close to where they are so that they don't have to travel long distances to get the services that they need, in addition to which their service providers don't have to travel long distances to get to them. So the types of the, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the types of things that would be rolled out as this plan is operationalized would be more services on the ground close to where people are, as opposed to, for instance, right now where some of our clinics operate in a health center setting where they have different clinics on different days of the week and 
we might have half a day per week for mental health. In the Northwest RHA, what currently exists are dedicated services where a mental health services service is available during working hours Monday to Friday. And we would like to see that model rolled out throughout the entire country so that regardless of how, where you live, how remote your location, you have access to mental health services throughout the work day. And there are other things we would like to do that we would talk more about as we go along. But those things will on stream even before COVID-19, and we are continuing to work on them. Thank you very much. 91.9. <coughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. morning. 1.9 FM. Um, Dr. Othello, just quickly, many of, of our colleagues in the media have to directly interact with a lot of people who may have been affected by COVID and a number of different things. I would like you just to spend some time just to specifically address some uh, mental health advice for media personnel who interact directly with people who suffer directly and also have their own issues to deal with. Uh, in particular, having to come up and just be around every day. And uh, Minister of Health, people yes, seem to be getting restless, aside Sorry? from just the complacency. They're getting very, very restless. And based on what we see in the international media, mm -hmm. it seems as though a lot of people are willing to take the risk or say that it's probably better to risk infection than to really ride through this mm -hmm. economic dump and lack of work and lack of being able to socialize and that kind of thing. And I know the main focus is making sure that the health system isn't overwhelmed. What's your take on people's thinking like that, that, you know, we could do this and let's go ahead and if we get infected, we get seen about and people are recovering. They prefer to go that way than to just stay inside and be on this particular, you know, path okay. that we are on currently. So I will take the second part first and then we go to Dr. Othello. One of the basic responsibilities of health or the government by that matter is the protection of its citizens. The option to just let people get infected and die is not an option in keeping with the functions of the Ministry of Health nor with the oath of office that any minister would have taken. The Prime Minister gave this country a very simple strategic objective from day one. Let us go out there and save lives. Very simple strategic objective. One of the reasons for having Dr. Othello here this morning is to address that same issue with Vern that you have put squarely on the table and you must be congratulated. Having Dr. Othello here is to talk to the population, to let them know they are not alone in this. We understand it is going to be difficult, but we have to cope. Because the alternative is, the, do you want to be dead with rights, or do you want to be alive after this peak to interact with your children, to see your grandchildren? And that, those are the choices we have. I prefer to be alive with some, with some curtailment to my current activities than to be dead with all the rights in the world. I see it now as a binary choice. But to be alive in the future, we are going to have to play our part in this pandemic. This is new, and I understand, and I empathize with all those who want to have life as usual. As I have said, this virus has changed the world more in four months than anything has changed the world in the past 400 years. We are fighting for, for survival. And I want to urge the media, and you have been doing a fantastic job, and the population, stay the course. Let's all come out of this alive so that we could have some sort of semblance of normalcy whatever that new normal is going to be sometime in the future. Over to Dr. Othello. I'm glad that question was asked by members of the media in terms of how do you cope during this situation. And the answer is even broader than the COVID-19 situation because you all 
in the line of your work don't just follow COVID-19. You follow deaths, you follow crime, you follow natural disasters, you follow all sorts of situations. So you're up close and personal with people on the ground who are going through very difficult situations a lot of the time. And what is important to you is the same thing that is important for us as healthcare providers and as mental health uh, service providers in particular. And that is that even though you listen to people's stories and you empathize, you cannot personally take on board everybody's emotional experience. Because if you do that, it will destroy you. You have to keep healthy for the long haul in order to continue to serve the public of Trinidad and Tobago by doing what you do because it's an important service. So you have to take care of yourselves. And part of that is not personally taken up taking on board the emotional aspect of people's experiences. You hear, you empathize, you provide support where you can, but you redirect those people to services that may be needed if they need help in terms of coping mentally. In addition to that, it's important for you as well to de-stress, just as it is for us at the end of your work day. So you do relaxing things, you engage in your hobbies, you pay attention to your spirituality. You do all those things that keep you mentally healthy. You seek help if you need it, because sometimes it could be tough. For some doctors, the first time they had to deal with a patient dying, they may have needed to seek some help from a senior doctor or colleague in order to cope. So don't feel bad if you have to seek help or if you have to talk to someone, a more senior colleague in your field, who would better be able to advise you in terms of strategies that may have worked for them and that may well work for you. So please, you know, maintain your, health, your healthy lifestyle, diet, exercise, and all those healthy things that keep body and mind well. And don't be afraid to seek help if you need it. Thank you very much. Before I go to another member of the media, I have a question to the CMO. Mm -hmm. So why emergency staff at SWRHA are given cloth masks to use while on work? And the person is saying that they thought cloth masks are to be used um, only by John Public and not medical staff. Okay, so <clears throat> if we go back to how we discussed levels of risk for healthcare workers on, on this um, press, press conference before, so we have stratified the way we are seeing patients with viral illnesses. So when we speak of triage, triage begins even before you come into the emergency department. So we have strategic areas set up so all your viral illness cases come to those areas. So, of course, those people who are in that particular area seeing patients with viral illness will have to be well protected in terms of masks, gloves, whatever they may, may have. I would have worked in the emergency department for many years myself. We would have never worn any sort of mask during that setting unless we had to do an invasive procedure, or unless there was some possibility of an infectious disease in a particular individual. Not everybody in a hospital needs to wear a mask all the time. So that's the first assumption that people are making, which is wrong. There are categories of risk. And as I said before, if you're intubating a patient, if you're seeing somebody that is being nebulized, you should be wearing an N95 mask, which is the highest level of respiratory protection that we have available to us. If you are seeing patients that are viral illness-like patients, um, out in a triage area, for instance, you may wear a surgical mask. So it depends on your level of risk. Southwest Regional Health Authority has begun a program quite a number of months ago to actually do some sewing within their sewing rooms for members, other members of their staff and even members of the public to wear the cloth mask as we have been recommending for the general population. So a physician sometimes who is in a very low risk setting may want to choose to wear a cloth mask as opposed to a surgical mask. That is their personal choice. In other instances, they would have wore, um, not worn a mask at all. So because we have COVID around, people are taking a little added degree of protection. At once you are not a healthcare worker that is deemed someone that requires a mask, then the choice is up to you. But in terms of Southwest, I can investigate the matter further with regards to which category of staff are wearing the cloth mask, as the post has suggested, with the CEO, and get some a little more detail as to who is wearing and ensure that the protocols are being followed meaning that the, the appropriate masks are being wear, worn by the appropriate members of staff. Thank you, Dr. Parasaram. Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Tesla Sambrano, Guardian Media. Mm -hmm. uh, my questions are for Dr. Tello. Okay. Um, 
Doctor, has there been an increase with people seeking help um, due to depression or mental illness due to issues surrounding COVID-19? And if so, what percentage or number you have noticed? And um, is the ministry doing anything more to treat with people who are depressed um, due to circumstances surrounding COVID-19? Okay. Dr. Otello? Okay. I'm not aware of any specific research that has been done as yet. In fact, I don't think any research has been done yet in order to provide specific details in terms of um, documenting increased help-seeking behavior. I suspect that that will come later on uh, as the disease process uh, you know, continues for a period of time and as there is enough time to allow meaningful research to take place because research has to be meaningful in the way it's designed and ruled out in order to get the, uh, so in order for the results to be valid. Uh, with respect to additional measures, uh, as I said, all the services are up and running and what we are doing is the mental health team leaders of the various RHAs are keeping in touch virtually so that as fast as additional mental health guidance is provided by the World Health Organization or by any other reliable sources, such as our reputable uh, med mental health journals, we share that information with each other. Not just mental health journals, even general medical journals are carrying uh, articles on mental health. I saw some excellent artic an excellent article on um, suicide risk and COVID in the Lancet a few days ago, and I forwarded that to the um, mental health team leaders of the different RHEs. So we are sharing information so that we are up to date and so that we are better able to, su to serve uh, the public that we are charged with serving. Thank you. Minister, you have anything to add? No, no, I'm good. Okay. Thanks. TV6. Good morning, everyone. Good, good morning, morning, Elizabeth. Good morning, Elizabeth Williams, TV6 News. What I wanted to know exactly in terms of, we would have received a memo from the Southwest Regional Health Authority um, indicating that there is a shortage of PPEs. I know that the Minister of Health would have spoken to that saying that there's no shortage, but there was a memo that was sent out from the Southwest Regional that. Health Authority um, speaking to the fact of a short a shortage of PPEs in areas such as level three asthma trauma filter um, medical records staff and they are also saying that they will not these areas will not be issued surgical mask as this is as a result of reduced quantity um, I don't know I know the minister most mm -hmm. likely will yeah. speak to that sure. and also we do thank our healthcare workers for what they have been doing for the country, but going beyond thanking, I don't know if the minister, if it has been brought up, if the minister is looking at remuneration for frontline workers. And I know, minister, I would have WhatsApp you on the issue of um, the situation of the Arima patient, and I know you said you would have looked into it. I don't know if you have an okay. update on that. So. The issue of PPE at the hospitals, let me remind, about three weeks ago, we indicated that a memo went out to all CEOs of all RHAs that they are to take direct management control of PPE. That system was put in place because we know that there are going to be international supply chain disturbances to PPE coming in. What you are seeing is a response to that protocol. I can tell you categorically, because I checked this morning, there is absolutely no shortage of PPE. As the CMO has described, they are stratified, and they are getting the appropriate PPE in the appropriate quantities, at the appropriate time, at the appropriate place. What is happening is that there is a response to the added layer of accountability that the CEOs have been mandated to implement to ensure that the same healthcare workers 
are not unduly exposed to COVID. It is a policy that we drove about three to four weeks ago. And what you are seeing is a response to the changed operationalization of how we give out P PPE. I checked again this morning with the principal pharmacists and PPEs have been delivered. That particular RHA is getting 4,000 masks this morning. So I take that with a pinch of salt. We are managing our PPE carefully and strategically. And I hope that um, answers the question again. The issue about ARIMA, I think the chief medical officer can come in there. I can't remember. Oh, that was a case. Yes, I remember the case, Elizabeth. And that person did receive their results on the 3rd of March. That was the case I had asked you about okay. in Arima. Yes, that person did receive their results on the 3rd of March. Thank you very much. TTT? Good morning. Ian Wilson from TTT. Now, yesterday I saw a report from ABC where American doctors are seeing a new trend where persons with no pre-medical condition developing strokes when mm -hmm. while being patients of COVID. Is that a concern here? Will it affect the way how we treat with patients? Okay. So as, as we all know, it is a very new virus. Once you have a new virus occurring, you tend to get, as the patient load increases worldwide, there's research that, that is going on in a parallel way to, di to discover how the virus is behaving and how the human body is reacting to the virus. So um, in terms of strokes, what we are seeing is an increased risk of thrombotic events, meaning blood clot formation, not only resulting in strokes, but resulting in other, other um, thrombotic events in different parts of the body, for example, pulmonary embolism and the like. So whatever new information is available to us, we disseminate to our clinicians once the, the data is valid data, because of course, we can't de take data that is ad hoc data from a number of, uh, maybe a small number of people. It has to be real data that is statistically significant. We will disseminate that to all our clinicians so that they are aware and abreast of the, of the new information that is coming so that we can adjust our treatment regimes to suit. But as I said before, the treatment of COVID is really supportive thus far. There's no specific treatment for it by way of uh, medication. Newsday. Hi, good morning, uh, Shane Supervisor. Good morning, morning Shane. Yeah, um, I have two questions. Whether the minister or the CMO, the first mm -hmm. one coming out of the women's clinic in Port of Spain General Hospital, I understand that uh, some of the patients at that clinic are getting some trouble in accessing appointments and prescription for some much needed medication. So I don't know if there's anything going on in the meantime to probably speak to that issue. Uh, the second one, I just want some clarification with respect to the prison's Eastern Correctional Rehabilitation Center. I understand it's being used as a quarantine station. So I just wanted to know the what? capacity Sorry. of Ministry of Health officials. Which facility is that, you, know, you the, uh, Eastern, the Eastern Correctional Rehabilitation Center in Santa Rosa Heights. I understand it's being one. used as a quarantine yeah. station. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know if um, the capacity of the Ministry of Health may be at that um, particular facility. I have absolutely no information that the Eastern Correctional Facility is being used for anything related to COVID. That, to me, is absolutely not a fact. Absolutely, the Ministry of Health has not, not spoken with anyone for the use of that facility. So I, I shed some doubt on that particular report and the chief medical officer will deal with the other part of the question. Right, so in terms of the women's clinic at Port of Spain, what I'll do is I'll liaise with the head of department of obstetrics and gynecology just to have a look into it, but I have not received a formal complaint from Port of Spain with, re with regards to that complaint. Okay, we move to Loop, Titi. Hi, good morning everybody. Nika Parsonal from Loop Titi here. Nico. Um, I just have two questions, one for Dr. Othello. Uh, doctor, we've noticed that there are posts on social media that are almost guilting people who haven't been able to be very productive during this time because of their mental states. Is there anything you can offer to those who feel like they've been misusing their time because of maybe that anxious feeling that they might have? 
what can you recommend? And uh, to Minister De Alsing, you had discussed care packages earlier this week for students abroad. I noted that quite a lot of these students, their concerns are about rent. And you did say that the conversation was happening with the Minister of Finance and that he was overseeing this. Do we have an update on those packages when they'll be sent out and maybe what they'll consist of? Okay, so I'll take the second question first. The Minister of Health never spoke about care packages to anyone outside of Trinidad and Tobago. It was the Minister of National Security. I have no domain outside of Trinidad and Tobago in supplying care packages. And I will certainly bring it up with the Minister of National Security who spoke to the issue when he was here. It's a very important point to note and I will liaise with him on that. Tobago Channel 5. Tobago Channel 5. Hi, good morning. Candice Jackson from Tobago Channel 5. Uh, my question is for Dr. Othello. I know some studies have shown that in a time of stress, um, some people react by feeling very sleepy and very tired. Um, <laughs> what can some of these people do so, them, so that they can remain active and have themselves a bit more engaged so they don't just fall victim to just perhaps, you know, just laying around all day? Hello? Dr. Yes, Dr. Otello, are you hearing? Yes, I'm hearing. Okay, As great. I said before, it's important to have a routine and to have a routine mm -hmm. that is as close as possible to your normal daily routine. So if you normally get up, at a certain time and have your meal at a certain time and have your shower, you know, and then settle down for work. Try to uh, develop a routine as close as possible to that. Even though if you don't have to work, get activities to engage yourself in that occupies the time that you would normally spend at work. That being said, sometimes lying in bed for prolonged periods and sleeping might be a sign of a mood disorder. It can certainly be a sign of depression. So that if there are other things are happening with respect to your mood, your the appetite changes, changes in concentration, changes in motivation in general, please reach out to a healthcare provider because you may be developing symptoms of a mood disorder and you may need some assistance in order to cope with that effectively. I think there was another question about something to do with social media, but I didn't hear all of what the question uh, that was it, being it asked from, from someone. Loop, did it? Oh. Okay, could Loop. we uh, go back to Loop Titi? I think um, there's a second part of your question that wasn't answered. Yeah, I had asked, uh, there, there are posts on social media where people are, I guess guilting people for not being as productive as other people. People are mm -hmm. starting businesses and having these great ideas and using their quarantine time. But there are people who've not been able to respond with that same sort of vigor during this time. I'm asking whether there's anything you can do to encourage them to feel okay about the fact that they may not be their best selves right now. What would you encourage them to do or how do you feel like they should use their time during this pandemic. Dr. Othello? Okay, again, we go back to what I said before about managing your sources of information. If your source of information is social media, you will be exposed to a lot of things that are unproductive and unhelpful. And if people are seeing things about you on social media that are negative, you need to stop exposing yourself mm -hmm. to that. And expose yourself to things that are more positive and more helpful. Okay, people should not be doing that. But as I always say, we don't have control over how people treat us. But what we can control is how we respond to it. And one of the effective responses is to sometimes limit access to those um, influences. If you yourself are feeling down or feeling sad or feeling unduly guilty about the fact that you're not working again, you may need to talk to a counselor in order to manage those emotions. So feel free to reach out. As I said before, there are the numbers for the uh, Regional Health Authority Mental Health Services. And there are also the numbers that have been offered by the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists 
with respect to the services that they have made available to the public. Thank you, Dr. Othello. Astronaut Health News. Gwyneth Stewart, Astronaut Health News. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good morning, Gwyneth. Dr. Hazel Othello, we really appreciate your recommendations for managing mental health, especially those of diet, exercise, rest, and even trust in God. Uh, but our question, my question has to do with people's tendency to binge in a time of stress. Uh, do we have any research on the impact of overeating on our emotions? And uh, my other question is to either Minister Dialsing or Dr. Parasram. Uh, we may have addressed this issue before, but do we have any updated theories on why uh, coronavirus survivors keep retesting positive? Um, let's Dr. Othello first. With regard to overeating, sometimes that can simply be a function of the fact that you are physically located in your home for longer hours than you normally would be. So that the refrigerator, unfortunately, is just too near and too accessible. So that is something we have to manage, particularly those of us who are trying to manage our weight. Minister has spoken about healthy lifestyles in the context of chronic diseases. And in order to manage our risk for chronic diseases, we have to manage weight. So that what I would recommend to those persons is that as you do your grocery shopping, stock up on fruit and healthy fruit at that. We have because there are some fruits that are just very sweet. If you're going to eat grapes, you have a few. If you're going to eat mangoes, you have one Julie mango and not six at a time because those things still have a lot of sugar in them. And of course, stock up on vegetables as well. And a lot has been said about access to vegeta fresh vegetables from our local farmers. So that if you are feeling the munchies a little more often than usual, then make sure that what you eat is healthy. But also in addition to that, remember, remember, remember structure. If you have a structure, if you have a schedule, you are less likely to keep going to the refrigerator. The one thing I would like to add to that, though, is that sometimes, as I said before, appetite changes can be a symptom of a mood disorder. So just like loss of appetite could be a symptom of depression, increased appetite could also be a symptom of depression. So if that, in the context of other things that are happening, like sleep changes, uh, uh, mood changes, if things like that are happening, like I said before, feel free to reach out. Before we go to the chief medical officer, I want to go back to the question that Shane asked about the Santa Rosa facility. I'm now seeing the article. Apparently, this is being done under the auspices of the um, Commission of Prisons, but the Ministry of Health, um, to the best of my knowledge, and the chief medical officer, uh, we are not involved in this, um, but the Commission of Prisons has this facility under his control. I just want to... Um, reiterate something that Dr. Othello just said. I am also trying to social distance from my refrigerator. In terms of the, the prisons as well, I just want to add the prisons, at least the one um, in the Arima area, Santa Rosa area, falls under the remit of the North Central Regional Health Authority. And for years, the, there, there have been physicians assigned primary care physicians to, to the prisons. So in terms of interaction, that would have been, if they are in the prison, they, it would have been in their normal course of their remit mm -hmm. through the North Central Health Authority. Um, not any special project as it relates to that facility. With regards to your question as testing positive, after you have tested negative, we have seen that occur in Trinidad. Granted, you, you, that's not the question you're asking. Go ahead. You could repeat yourself. Why do persons keep retesting positive who have okay. had the disease mm -hmm. and it has passed and then... After some time, they retest Correct, positive yeah. again. Yeah, so what, what I was describing is basically you are positive, you become negative, and then you test positive again, right? And we have seen that happen in Trinidad. So you have the disease. Um, our discharge criteria is very rigid. As you know, it, it is different from other parts of the world. You have to wait 15 days from the onset of symptoms before you have your first negative test that can be taken. And even when that, that was done in a number of patients, we found they had a negative then they had a positive right after, which is unusual for a virus. And then you wait seven days, and sometimes even after the seven days, you have a negative, and then you have a positive again. So we are seeing that phenomenon occurring not only in Trinidad, in other parts of the world. 
It, it is not unique, though, to this particular virus. There are some other parasites, for example, malaria, that you have resurgence of a particular illness. So, for instance, you would have a negative test done for malaria today, and then maybe two months down the line, you have a positive without any further exposure. In malaria, for instance, the pathogenesis is known. What happens is that there's a, a sort of reservoir that occurs in your liver that keeps it away from your bloodstream, and it reactivates. So there's no specific theory for this new virus. However, it is a phenomenon that we have noted, and research is going on throughout the world to try to describe it better and to see what is causing it. But our protocols are driven for discharge especially, knowing fully well that there can be that phenomenon occurring, and that's why we have our two negatives um, 24 hours apart, and then having that wait in bit before to ensure that people don't become positive after we discharge them. Thank you. Sunil Lala? Hi, good morning. Sunil Lala from Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. Good morning, good Sunil. Morning. The, the CMO, I know yesterday you said that um, you were to receive the, the test results from the CMO in Barbados with regards to the nationals. Uh, did you receive that? And if Correct. presuming all of those are negative, what is the next step for these nationals? Are they to go through a 14 day quarantine period and then two tests, uh, two, two negative tests will be released? And finally, the Ms. Minister Dial Singh, mm -hmm. uh, the US Senate of St. Campus yesterday announced that there were 99 students on call, uh, mainly, mostly regional students. Have you been in contact with them to provide any uh, assistance to them or in contact with the, the campus principal, Brian Copeland? So I will take the second part, and the answer is um, no, I have not been in contact with Professor Copeland on the specific issue that you have raised. Okay, in terms of the test results, the, as I said before, the patients were actually sent individual test results via email from the CMO of Barbados. I received an email from him late in the afternoon, yesterday afternoon, with the test results as well, which I forwarded to Dr. Best, who is the CMO for that particular county. She is the one who has to actually make sure that all of them have received their result. We can only give a test from the physician, attending physician, to the patient. And they will be counseled as to what it means to them individually and as a group. Our point of exposure, as, as I keep saying, with this epidemic, we have seen a lot of people infected in airports. As we know, this particular group would have come through an airport recently within the last few days. Any test result that is done now gives us a good baseline to see what, what a particular group looks like. People have been saying you have two negatives and you can go home. That two negative 24 hours apart doesn't speak to persons that have not been infected. It doesn't speak to people that are in self-quarantine. What it speaks to is somebody who is positive. We wait the 15 days after your onset of symptoms and then we have two negative results. If someone comes in to any, any facility without, with a negative tests and then you repeat it 24 hours in, in afterwards and they have no symptoms it there's no guarantee that those tests won't be false negatives because they have no symptoms and as we have been saying from the start CAFA receives tests generally after the onset of symptoms PCR tests work best and we know this between 0 to, to 10 days of actually having symptoms appear so 0 to 5 days in terms of anybody that is deemed at risk and returning to the country we our time of quarantine is 14 days because those are the, those are the length of time that we expect symptoms to reappear of course if symptoms reappear we will retest um, during that period but generally speaking our quarantine period remains 14 days for anybody who returns we i just want to draw you take you back to the balandra group where we had persons aboard a cruise and they were similar situation a large group of people come into quarantine they came into the country they would have been tested out of the 68 originally that were tested, 40 were positive or right off the bat, and the remaining were negative. In that cohort, we found that a number of them, after a few days, some from a few weeks, became positive thereafter. So we have to we have to treat every person on their merit based on their individual exposures, but exposure in this instance begins much more early, and as I said, false negative results. Uh, something that we can't rely upon when people don't have any symptoms. Express? Good morning, Camille Hunt Express. Morning, Camille. Morning. 
my questions are for Dr. Parasram on the issue of testing and results. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some patients who are saying they've been tested and they've been waiting since April 15th to get their results. Why does it take so long for them to get results? And are patients being retested in a timely manner? Because there are concerns that the time between testing is too long. Can you shed some light on that? Right. So, so the as far as my information says to me, um, people have the results have been given to patients in a timely manner. There's an actual process that occurs through the principal medical officer of epidemiology, and he would get that lab result electronically sent to him and disseminate to all the patients as soon as it, it is available through the Caribbean Public Health Agency. So it generally takes a few days to actually do the test, as I've said before, 24 to 48 hours. That's the physical test. And in terms of preparing the reports and uh, everything that goes along, we're looking at about maybe three days, four days max in terms of that time frame. I, not, I have not come across a test that is outstanding for that long. You had a second part to that question? Um, you answered it. Okay, okay. great. Okay. Power 102. Good morning, head table. Kimberly D'Souza from Power 102. Morning, Kimberly. Good morning. morning. I just have one question for Dr. Othello. Um, Dr. Othello, I know that the Commissioner of Police would have mentioned a few weeks ago that domestic violence is on the rise because people are at home. I was just wondering if you have any tips or any um, advice for people who are sequestered at home right now with their abusers. I know we usually tell patients of, or victims of domestic violence that they should leave, and of course we have the gender-based units, but what can we tell persons who are actually home with their abusers? Thanks. Dr. Othello? Okay, at this time, um, it is recognized internationally that there is an increased risk for intimate partner uh, violence because of the fact that people are in close quarters for prolonged periods of time, and also because it's a time of increased stress which can contribute to increased violence. Also, unfortunately, some people during this time abuse substances like alcohol which can increase the risk for uh, violence. So what we would say to potential uh, victims, persons who in a situation where you can be exposed to domestic violence is that one, you have to have things that you do that are relaxing, that bring you peace, that bring you comfort at the times that you are safe so that you can keep your stress levels down. However, you have to have a plan for times when you may not be safe. In other words, you must have um, knowledge of the phone numbers that you can call for assistance, whether it's the nearest police station or the available helplines that you may be able to call and get assistance. Uh, Whatever you do, do it in the way that is most safe so that you do not uh, become a statistic and we're not blaming you if something bad happens to you so I'm not saying that you actively set out to become a statistic but people tend to know their situation and to know what they can do to keep themselves safe but at the same time have a plan and have things you know try to organize your life in such a way that if you need to leave suddenly you can have your documents stored in a place that is safe and easily accessible If there is a way that you can have a bag packed and hidden so that if you need to grab it quickly and leave, you can do that. And if you have to leave quickly to save your life and you have to leave everything behind, please do that. You can always recover material possessions, but you cannot recover your life. So the bottom line is to do everything that you can to stay safe, but to reach out to the authorities that are charged with assisting you if you need that kind of assistance. Thank you, Dr. Othello. CNC3? Morning, Carissa Lee from CNC3. Morning, Carissa. Morning, Carissa. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Othello as well. Mm-hmm. My question is, you know, stay at home orders or stay at, staying at home does not mean the same for everyone. There are families without internet access who do not have, who do not have board games, cable, um, any advice for them? You know, some of them may be tempted, more tempted than someone who has the ability to binge watch a show on Netflix or, or scroll through Instagram. 
uh, any advice for them? They may be tempted to leave their home more than you know people who have access. You also mentioned that you know, um, you speak, some people you know, keep in contact with your family through WhatsApp, etc. Some people don't have that. Don't have that. So, any advice for them? Well, you have to be creative in terms of finding ways to maintain a schedule and to keep in touch with people. Uh, if you have, if there are several family members in that household, there are things you can do together. You can play games together. You can sing songs together. You could play music and dance together. So find things that you can do. If you have photo albums from, you know, pictures that have been taken over the years, you can go back over them and laugh about past experiences that the family shared. Do what you can together as a family in order to fill time in a constructive, meaningful way and do whatever you can to maintain some structure. You may be able to go out in the yard and do a bit of gardening. That doesn't cost anything. You may transplant some potted plants or plant some fruit or vegetables. There are things you can do that don't cost very much but can bring you pleasure and keep you engaged and keep you happy and finding meaning in life. Thank you, Dr. Othello. We are almost out of time, but I go back to ACP News. One question, please. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Zakox. Um, I was trying to find out um, in terms of, of what is happening with, with the, with the um, um, consumer testing. Um, is it feasible for the ministry to do a comparison with people who have passed away from from this year, the beginning of this year to now, um, due to um, pneumonia respiratory issues, and compare that to the same period last year and the year before? Is that something to consider? Well, I mean, any any comparison of that is um, can be done. The data normally lies with the registrar of of births and deaths through the, through that office. Um, I know my epidemiology unit has been reaching out to them since last year to get statistics for various things. We have the registry, cancer registry, which we actually have real statistics as it relates to cancer. So all cause mor mortality data is what we what we normally get from them. So it is something that we are we continuously explore and get data from time to time. I mean, any data is is important epidemiologically and will be useful. So we can explore that as well. TV6. One question, please. Okay. Good morning again, Elizabeth Williams. Good morning. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have been receiving reports from most of the pharmacies in Tobago that they are not accepting CDAP anymore. And it is hard for a number of patients, diabetes, and other patients with high blood pressure. I don't know if the minister can look into this. So I did that just this morning. Um, I could tell you that at, the, at NIPDEC and the Ministry of Health, we can tell you that there has been a 39% increase in the number of CDAP drugs given out um, over the past month. We have no proven information, but we will certainly look, on, look into it, what I can tell you is that knowing that international supply chains were going to be disrupted, we gave the order about a month ago, and I said it at this forum, it's good to repeat it because different people look in, that CDAP will no longer be dispensed in three and six month amounts. They will only be dispensed in one month quantities. That is to ensure that persons, especially suffering from life-threatening um, diseases like asthma, and then chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes can receive a consistent supply of drugs. I will certainly ask NIBDEC and the ministry to verify what you are saying about Tobago. Um, but as we stand now, CDAP is readily available. There were only two drugs that we were concerned about. One was sodium valparate used to treat epilepsy. There was a global shortage. That came into the country on the 9th of April. And there is a little hiccup with simvastatin, which is used to treat high cholesterol. So we are managing that, and we have a shipment coming in on the 27th of April. 
So out of the whole seed of many who have drugs, those were the two that were disturbed because of international supply chain issues. But on the Tobago issue specifically, we will look into it. Thank you very much, Minister. Members of the media, we are way past our time. We've come to the end of today's virtual media conference. And do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. We know you miss your social relationships and connections, and it might even feel that everything you value has been replaced by loneliness, isolation, and stress. This is not unique to you, and you are not the only one struggling. Let us use this gift of extra time to refocus on family, strengthen existing friendships, and reignite old ones while practicing social distancing. Let us try to put into practice some of the tips Dr. Othello shared with us earlier. They are practical and easy to implement as we adjust to our new circumstances. Do remember that we are in this together. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its effort to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home, stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs>